You're in the water loop. <laughs> Hey everyone, this is Travis with Waterloop. I want to tell you about the Flume Smart Water Monitor that I use at my house. Flume is the perfect device for tracking your water usage in real time with your smartphone. You can see exactly how much water you're using with showers, toilets, sinks, appliances, outside irrigation, any way you use water. Flume lets you set daily, weekly, and monthly water budgets. It also alerts you if there's excessive water use and if it detects a leak. In fact, Right when I hooked up Flume at my house, it alerted me of a leak. I was losing a gallon of water every six minutes outside of my water line. Turns out it had been there for months, and I was wasting ridiculous amounts of water and money. I'm not sure when I would have found that without Flume. Flume is super easy to install. You wrap a band around your water meter, just like you put a watch on your wrist. Connect to Wi-Fi, download the app, and you're all set. No plumber needed. Now you can use promo code WATERLOOP to save 15% off of Flume at flumetech.com. With Flume, you'll never be surprised by a water bill again. Waterloop, Waterloop, Waterloop. Welcome to Waterloop. This is Travis, joined for this episode by Lemeshia Winnington Kaminsky. She is Deputy Political Director for Advance Carolina and Organizing Campaign Director for NC Black Alliance. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. Thank you, Travis, for having me. It's great to be here today. Yeah. So I uh, kind of, I guess, encountered you, met you at a screening of Dark Waters here in Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, it was a, an incredible evening since Wilmington is one of the communities that's been impacted by Gen X, which is part of that PFAS family. Mm -hmm. um, we were fortunate to have Mark Ruffalo even join us that evening. But you were one of the people that took stage beforehand, mm -hmm. um, and you really blew me away with your... Uh, fire in, in your speaking, um, not just your words and your delivery, really powerful. Um, and as what, could you explain where that, where that comes from? Uh, absolutely. Um, so again, thanks for having me here. Uh, and it was wonderful to meet you, um, at that screening and it was phenomenal to just, um, see just an activist and an individual such as Mark Ruffalo, uh, use his celebrity to, uh, elevate our concerns as a state to the national level and the work that has been done by advocates on the ground here for many years in this fight um, against uh, dirty corporations and the fight for clean water and clean air. And I definitely want to lift that first. Um, and that goes into part of uh, just, as you mentioned, Travis, my passion for um, just the fight. It's where I come from. I'm from uh, the mountains, Appalachian Mountains of North Carolina, born and raised. My entire family is from there. Uh, we are part of the Black Indigenous group that was there uh, prior to slavery. So we, over years, we were farmers. Uh, sustainable agriculture was a part of like our lifeline and is still a part of my bloodline um, even now. And so growing up uh, in a clean air environment, clean water environment, and smelling that crisp mountain air every day as a child and understanding that I was free and what that freedom felt like. And then to be here in this current iteration and our current state and to see other communities who were not afforded the opportunity to uh, grow up in their adolescence or just grow up in general, um, even into adulthood, to experience what I experienced, uh, it, it, it fuels me to fight because everyone should know what clean air feels like and clean water tastes like. And that should be a, a human right that is afforded to all uh, beings, especially our children. So that's part of why I do what I do. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you can feel that uh, you can feel that energy when when you uh, are around you and when you hear you speak and all that. It's awesome stuff. It really, I think, it motivates people in a tremendous way. Uh, environmental justice. So a lot of people are familiar with this term, but I think a lot of people aren't as well. Um, and so I'm I'm curious to have you explain what that means. Sure, sure. So environmental justice, um, many advocates, many uh, groups on the ground have different definitions of environmental justice, as do organizations. Um, and so, you know, defining environmental justice, we can go from the, the regulated term um, or the, the legal definition is the fair treatment of all people um, with their involvement in issues that pertain to development and implementation of laws and regulations of everything from corporations to response to uh, disaster, climate disasters such as hurricanes and so forth. So it's supposed to be the fair and equitable treatment and involvement. Um, to break that down a little bit further in my terms, so this is you know my personal definition and it is ever evolving, right, is that environmental justice is the people 
in our fight for a clean environment. It's the justice is the people. Mm. And that's the missing part that when we're looking at policy and regulations that are are not taking in the voices and the experiences, the lived experiences of folks and the trauma that has been burned and burdened on their backs of what they've gone through, what their children have gone through. If we are missing their voices in creating policy and law that will inform their everyday lives, then that's not justice. And so that's the important part of environmental justice is it's seeing clearly how we are communicating with our own neighborhoods, our own communities, but also how can our local, state, and federal government um, begin our electeds, right? Our elected leaders Mm -hmm. can uh, join with us to create our experiences into equitable policy. Mm -hmm. And uh, the people that most suffer from environmental injustice, right? It's a lot of, it's low income communities, it's communities of color, uh, it's People in, people in very urban environments, people in rural environments, people in uh, indigenous areas, right, along the U.S.-Mexico border, Alaska, reservations, yes. right? These are the types of communities that are really uh, at the forefront of this. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, it, you're absolutely spot on. Uh, when we look at, there were studies um, done by the Toxic Waste and Race Report of people are interested. Um, and it was a report that found that 56% of residents living within a two mile radius of toxic waste facilities were people of color. That's mm. 56% nationally. Um, we see that people of color in 46 states live with more air pollution than persons who are not persons of color. Um, and so when we're also looking at rates of like exposure to these toxic uh, waste facilities and um, when you're looking at oil refineries and so forth, you're also looking at the fact that um, income is for, you know, low income communities are impacted, but also communities of color who have income specifically like black Americans, even if they make an income between 50 and $60,000, their living environmental conditions are equal to uh, white residents who a $10,000 median salary. So even more potent in uh, actually like defining environmental impacts than even um, we could see like income and economic uh, just prosperities of certain areas. So yes, you're exactly right. Communities of color and frontline communities that have a, a lower economic prosperity level are definitely impacted more so by environmental injustices. Yeah, and what you've just said shows that this is not about perceived injustices or or just anecdotal injustices. There's there's hard data and science and research behind all this that that, that clearly illustrates the problems. You know, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. What about environmental justice and water? Can you just build that out a little bit and what what the usual concerns are there? Since that's you know water's kind of the focus of my my podcast. Right. Absolutely. So, you know, to, to bring it back to even these frontline communities in North Carolina, um, as it pertains to Wilmington and other East North Carolina communities, we are looking at the fact that, for example, during Hurricane Florence, we saw over 5 million gallons of um, just hog waste and chemicals that are involved in that hog waste was spilled into the waterways. These were the same waterways uh, that were contaminated by the PFAS in Gen X, uh, when we see in New Hanover, Wilmington, when we see in Bladen and Cumberland County. So these are the exact same areas that are already burdened with the pollution that is dumped because of climate disasters. And we have had three, right? Mm-hmm. Um, 500 and 1,000 year storms within, uh, well, three to four years. We had Matthew, we had Florence, we even had Dorian that impacted Ocracoke Island and other areas. These are all back to back. And every single time there has been a breach in our water of really hard contaminants and pollution that has, of course, impacted our drinking water our, when we turn just well water and public water. When we're looking at the fact that how is our soil? What's the restoration? What is the, the oversaturation? And now the chemical pollution that we're seeing within our water when we're even looking at soil and crops. And so in addition to those climate disasters, we're looking at dirty corporations who have been at fault, such as like Travis, when we met at the uh, screening of, um, of, of the movie of Mark Ruffalo, we were looking at the fact that here's dirty corporations that have here's a legacy of dumping thousands and thousands up to millions of pollutants in our water that we are still dealing with. And that is in our bloodstreams Mm. and still dealing with the lack of medical data 
to help people in this time of crisis to even pinpoint how has this impacted you physically. We estimate that there's cancer. We 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 see the impacts in, in having like liver um, issues, kidney, when we talk about dialysis, children with a cancer rates that they shouldn't even be experiencing, period, but definitely not at the ages of three, four, and 11 years old. And so that's the impacts that we're seeing in our water that's that has been going on. And this is just a tip of the a tip of the iceberg. Yeah. So I, just to go back on some of that. So here in the Carolina coast, you've got these hurricanes that are coming in. They've come in for a long time, right? But they're coming in stronger. They're coming in more frequently thanks to climate change. So people right. are, are bearing the impacts of just that directly and the damage done to their homes and their property and the job loss and all that kind of thing. So that's a big impact. And then for people that don't know, Eastern North Carolina has one of like the largest, you know, CAFO concentrations, right? These hog farms uh, and all of the pollution that comes from that. So like you said, those are th- those are regular impacts that they're that people are dealing. Then when you have storms come in, you've got the overflows and spills. So it's like this, uh, I don't know, coalescing of different factors all that just yes. magnify, you know. Uh, and then, like you said, Gen X in the in the Cape Fear River, other other pollutants out there. Um, mm-hmm. Are there? So this is kind of the coastal picture a little bit. I'm not as familiar maybe with, you know, the middle of the state, the mountainous areas, maybe water challenges people have there when it comes to environmental justice. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, coal ash has been um, a consistent impact uh, on the state. Um, we've definitely seen the east. We've seen it um, when we're talking about the the center triad, Piedmont triad of the state uh, from Charlotte over to the west. They're dealing with impacts of coal, coal ash, the impacts of deforestation mm-hmm. and the residual impacts on water source and water supply in the west specifically as it pertains to the mountains. But we can definitely see a connectivity throughout the state as it pertains pains to coal ash. And we also saw that breach the same way during the hurricane. So not only is uh, coal ash uh, an issue at the hands of, once again, a corporation, um, and our manufacturing and our production is stepping up to the modern age, but then the cleaning of and the watersheds. Um, and so that's what we're seeing connectivity. And there are other examples, but coal ash is definitely what comes to mind as we are currently and have been advocates have been fighting on the ground to, to have that cleaned up. Yeah. I know that a lot of people in Appalachia, you know, in West Virginia and Ohio and Virginia and Kentucky, you know, have, uh, there's a lot of uh, tough communities where it's really tough, um, especially because of the impacts of like mining, mountaintop mining, things like that. I mean, that doesn't happen as much in the mountains of North Carolina, right? No, no. And I won't speak too much on that industry only because, yeah, I that isn't my field, but gotcha. definitely advocates at this point have been fighting. Yeah, that has been a historic industry that we have. But as far as in this iteration, it's now looking at the impacts of cleanup from mm-hmm. sites that were not seen as an issue prior to being mandated uh, and declared by the DE as being a contaminant source. So we're looking at old structures needing to be cleaned and renewed, and that does impact the mountains in the same way. Yeah. Uh, Something else I wanted to ask you about with hurricanes, sorry to jump back to that, but uh, I read about this idea of unfair political maps, right? Like the the crazy gerrymandering that's gone on in North Carolina, rigging these districts, which is like, just look at a picture and the way the pieces are cut out. (laughs) It's like insane. Um, how, How has that... Uh, gerrymandering basically put, you know, disproportionate impacts on, on people. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. And I appreciate just you framing that in this conversation uh, of environmental justice, because it cannot, uh, it cannot be separate. There's a deep intersection. And so part of my background is I'm considered a North Carolina redistricting expert. Um, and so that has allowed me to be able to focus in on with an environmental justice this lens, how exactly does gerrymanders exacerbate uh, the environmental injustices that we see? And so some of the research um, that my team facilitated and that I led was looking at specifically the previous gerrymanders, even though they're not old, they are our old gerrymanders, old by what, three years, right. maybe max. Um, <laughs> uh, here we are. Um, and so what we saw is a deep correlation with the exact um, locations of these p- uh, corporations that are causing the contaminants in our water, the breaches and so forth, were actually located perfect shape 
within the same gerrymanders. Mm -hmm. The gerrymanders also were found guilty for racial discrimination and gerrymandering. So we're seeing that layering of what you lifted earlier, Travis, is that, you know, these these uh, burden um, of, of pollution in communities of color, in indigenous communities. Uh, we have the largest indigenous community east of the Mississippi with the Lumbee Nation. We have the largest African-American population in the state in eastern North Carolina because it's considered the black belt. Um, and so we're seeing that that is where the concentration of corporations are. Like you lifted the number one um, hog production facility in, in the world, as it's claimed, but definitely in the nation is Duplin County. And number two is right beside it by 10 minutes at Sampson. They are within the same district. So we were looking at this entrenchment of power and, you know, the fact that gerrymanders were really drawn in a way that supports these corporations. And it supports it in the sense of a se several different ways. We um, noticed that some of the original individuals elected that were part of the original gerrymandering committees also had taken up to $200,000 in campaign contributions from the same corporations that are now being sued and have been sued by community members because they polluted their waterways. Mm. And they polluted their soil. So we're seeing that some of the electeds that cannot be removed by gerrymanders, right, because you can't vote gerrymandered politicians out as easy if, you know, yeah. uh, in a civic process, these are the same folks that are now giving protection bills and protection uh, farm bills for these corporations who are literally harming and causing the illnesses within our community. So there's a deep intersection that cannot be separated between environmental justice and democracy. It just can't. That's that's very interesting. I've always thought of gerrymandering as just like carving out where they can get the Republican votes or whatever party votes and just keep getting elected to office. But there's right. this like corporate business interest uh, factor there. Very fascinating. Absolutely. Yeah, well, I mean, Absolutely. And I encourage people to go look into this and, and just do some Googling and you can learn a lot more about it. Uh, that's how I just Put the topic on the list was seeing some of the stuff you've been involved with. So, um, why do you think that there's such a a lack of awareness of problems with water and environmental justice? You know, uh, I, I, there's a, there's a good voice out there. You see some more media stories. You see it on social media, but I think in, among the general public, um, there's not an awareness of the disproportionate impacts that are out there. Right, right. So where do we start, yeah. Travis? Where do we, where <laughs> do we a, begin? There's a, there's a lot of history <laughs> for sure, right? There's a lot. Um, you know, so first I always want to give credit where credit is due. There are so many phenomenal organizations on the, on the ground that have, and, and community members, even if they're not organizations, even if they choose to not be organizations, there are a collection of community leaders that have... Um, been leading this fight of educating their communities, keeping the communities informed, even though they are, uh, you know, ill and sick and trying to go to medical visits because of these contaminations. And, and there are leaders who have been working and organizations. And, you know, I implore listeners to definitely check out groups as, you know, uh, Democracy Green, North Carolina Black Alliance, Environmental Justice Network, um, and there's so many, I don't want to just, you know, um, misname Reach and Duplin. There's so many um, that we could really talk about. Um, so I want to lift that. But part of the issues, as I see it, is there is, as we just spoke, there's this intersection between democracy reform and environmental justice, but they are treated as two separate subjects mm -hmm. by what we see in the media. We usually don't see a deep correlation in the media around um, how is this environmental problem, but how is this water problem that is causing folks to be sick? How is that hurting you when it comes time to vote? Mm. How does that hurt you when it comes time to voice to your leaders, your elected leaders that, hey, we actually need to have stricter policy and, and stricter guidelines on what exactly these corporations are allowed to do? And if that connectivity isn't brought through education and deep community investment by folks who do have like funders and foundations that are coming into communities. If that focus isn't there, then we're missing bringing along folks in an organic long-term way that they can inform us of things that we can't understand because we're not impacted. But then if we're not combining resources with the impact, we're not really moving change, right? We're divided. Yeah. Um, and so I would say, you know, the media marketing and then the other part is the terminology, as I've noticed over the landscape, um, has changed, right? So years ago, where I grew up, 
cultures have different sayings for different things. When we talk about dirty water, different cultures call that different things. Mm. And so sometimes if it's called, you know, uh, let's use, for example, an outlier. If we discuss coal ash or we discuss even another outlier, fracking, what does that word really mean to communities? Mm. Right, right. And does it translate the same? Because still, you know, when we talk about our um, higher education, and that's still a community. So even if they're a community of issue experts, right, subject matter experts, and they create a word, does that translate to the community that is impacted? And where can that connectivity be made? Well, the end, the end product is dirty water, wherever, whichever one of those things is causing it, right? Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, there's obviously big cultural issues. I mean, I, I think of myself, right? Like I, I just grow up in a general a suburb and um, I didn't really encounter environmental justice issues or that these things were happening out there until I got to the US EPA in my early 30s, right? And we have programs that focus on on this. And I, I just maybe was living in some bubble, right? And I think that's probably the case for a lot of people is it's just not part of the conversation and realizing that uh, our fellow our fellow citizens, our, our people in our community in some way are, are suffering. And so it's got to be more talk mm -hmm. about it um, in general conversation, if that makes sense. So um, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I want to pivot because uh, I, I don't like just to talk about all the, the doom and gloom, but I want to talk about solutions and successes and stuff. Right. So um, how how do you and and your organizations and the organizations you've rattled off how are they working to uh, address these problems you know what are what are the the successful approaches i guess Absolutely. Um, so historically, we can see successful approaches uh, has been a combination of litigation, so pressure uh, through litigation and lawsuits, and pressure through community response, right? And so we see that North, North Carolina is very good at both. I mean, we may go through a lot of things, but historically, we are top dollar when it comes to fighting back and galvanizing and mobilizing our people. It's like, it's raised within us, that's even awesome. if we don't realize it, right? Yeah. And so that's what you really see with North Carolina. And, you know, historically, to back it up a little bit, um, we saw the environmental justice movement was birthed uh, in North Carolina for the nation. Not that other environmental justice movements wasn't happening. Uh, it's that the catalyst for environmental justice as we know it, and even the litigation practices as we know it was birthed in 1982, in Warren County, North Carolina, right? And so that was because it was a mix of community protests of, of individuals, mostly communities of color, residents of color who came out and sacrificed their bodies to the cause of being arrested and sitting and standing in roadways to block trucks from bringing in contaminated soil into their area, into their homes. And this was mixed, blended with the ongoing simultaneous fight of litigation to say this isn't right legally, you mm -hmm. see what the people are saying. And so we saw that and that resulted, even though they were not successful in winning that fight in 1982, what they were successful in is changing the discourse of the conversation as it pertains to fair and equitable treatment of communities, frontline communities for the nation. Mm. And so we've seen that, you know, here lately in, in the new day, we see uh, organizations when we talk about clean uh, the Cape Fear River Watch, who was uh, the leaders and instrumental along with advocates to uh, achieve the consent order, Kimor's, you know, from DEQ, but to hold Kimor's accountable. That's recent fights that were won because of the blend of the leadership of subject matter experts, right? Litigation and policy and the support that when we see these community outreach efforts of the people, we see that um, when we're talking about the hurricane relief and the breaching in our water, the response was amazing from community members on the ground who were going through this. They galvanized together with state and local organizations to make a literal collective. And they dropped, they, first of all, we as a group saved over up to 300 people literally pulled them out the water. We worked with our sheriff's office, our EOCs, uh, Cajun Navy, just random groups <laughs> that were just doing the work, 
but we came together using such uh, social media platforms as Facebook, yeah. nothing fancy, <laughs> not ten, and we were just calling each other on Facebook messages saying, where are you? And we were pulling people out of the water. Then we had every week, three to four U-Haul truck drops. We dropped thousands of supplies through like air, Operation Airdrop, through on the ground. This And the group that did this, that we called it was just Florence Recovery Collective. This was just during Florence. This was 2018. And the response was so successful that we were in discussion with Puerto Rico. Mm. Right. So we're seeing a, a, a reaching to our neighbors and they were informing us how they were able to do mutual aid. And then because they were informing us and we were learning while we were doing. Then when Hurricane Michael came through in Florida, we were receiving calls from my from people that didn't know us, by the way, on Facebook, heard it through the grapevine, said we need supplies because our water, we have no fresh water. We were run out of bottled water. We can't make formula. I mean, this is stuff we were hearing for our babies and we can't, we need stuff for our elderly, uh, our elders. And we literally dropped with Operation Airdrop in a whole transfer truck. We got them supplies within the same four days that they asked for the, uh, the supplies. Mm. That's the kind of movement that North Carolina is still doing, has been doing. And, you know, so that's some examples. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, good. I mean, uh, there's a lot of negative uh, perceptions and critiques of social media these days, but it's still a, there's a lot of benefits too. I mean, it's a powerful tool for bringing people together. That's awesome how you can literally save lives uh, by connecting people through through Facebook. Right. Um, any other examples of uh, how of progress in, in kind of delivering justice and community benefits ar around water. Those are great examples with, with rescuing people mm -hmm. and helping when a, when a climate change fueled hurricane strikes. But, um, what else, what else is going on, uh, in successes? In right. Your mind? Right. Right. So two things that come to mind is so a whole list, but at least two things is one, um, ensuring that when we are talking about what does water justice look like when we're talking about environmental justice how can we bring those conversations into the democracy space mm. so when we're talking about packages and policies like uh, there's a, a package that was passed last year by the house u.s house called hr1 for the people act right and so some people have different opinions on it but it was it's a comprehensive like reform package yep. well in that package we mentioned environmentalism mm -hmm. when we were talking about it's big yeah, right and, yeah. and it, it needs to be right and in north carolina we introduced a golden standard redistricting bill but we actually added a line of how to protect environmental communities of interest that's the first time in what we understand that we know of that environmental communities have really been written in how to be protected when drawing maps. Mm. So that's first. Like when we're talking about policy and litigation, we have to make sure that there are folks that are in the room that could say, while you're talking about freedom with voter registration and you're talking about accessibility to the polls and you're talking, you also need to talk about accessibility when we are environmentally polluted. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. when we are sick. Sure. That's one. And the second thing is in response to COVID. What I, you know, we're still in the current, like this, we're still right now in the middle of this crisis. We still don't know uh, what really the future looks like in terms of what communities will need and the response long term, because this is a, this is still a disaster. Mm -hmm. It's just an unknown disaster. And so with that, the practices that were implemented during Florence is making the way and shedding light on how we are operating now. We are already having a uh, movement on the ground, the community pressure, as I said before, we have already given a list of demands that lifts up also environmental impact to the governor of North Carolina just yesterday mm -hmm. and his office as to how to protect communities. We already had those conversations and we're having more conversations next week. We've already held press conferences on Zoom last week and it lifted impact voices to say exactly what they're going through and how COVID response and rainy day funds, right? needs to be allocated for people now, not later. We're already in that motion, but it's because the work and the groundwork that was laid several years ago and that climate disaster that impacted our waters and because we survived and we survived and did it well, it's now informing our response now for our people on the ground, even in COVID. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that's amazing to me with this, with all of this is that it's just such a fight and it's about just building, right? It's about building on the previous successes or the previous step forward, right. so you can achieve more and more and more, till you ultimately get to those to those goals and to that justice that you're you're seeking for everybody, right? 
<laughs> yeah. So how can um, people that want to support this, you know, these changes and they want to support environmental justice, they want to support clean water for everybody. What are, what are things that those, that people can do? Absolutely. Um, so a couple of different things. So, you know, number one, uh, if you're in North Carolina, um, definitely look up organizations to reiterate here. Um, Environmental Justice Network, powerful organization, uh, Brunswick Housing Opportunities, Pender United. These are some just Florence Recovery Collective. These are some major networks that if you do plug into, like you email and you reach out to these groups, that that will introduce you to cohorts of individuals and organizations that are working in this on the ground as we speak. And so definitely look up those organizations online, reach out to them, and most definitely there will be response so that you're connected. Um, So that's just immediate response, right? Immediate connection. Um, Long term um, is, you know, the petitions that are going around by the North Carolina United for Survival and Beyond that's the petition of demands that I just lifted that we crafted that takes in place um, populations across North Carolina and what we need in this time of response for COVID mm-hmm. is sign on to that petition, mm-hmm. right? Look up that petition, read it. Even if you're not um, just yet available or with the craziness that's happening right now, giving of your time while we need to protect our families, we totally understand um, engagement will look different. So sign on to the petition. Um, if your time allows, that would be great. And, and so those are two clear steps. And third is, uh, definitely, uh, looking in your own area. There's a website called home H O M E facts, F A C T S.com. And no, I'm not an administrator or author of that website. Um, but I am a user, frequent user, and that website will actually tell you exactly what contaminants and pollution sites have been identified around your proximity. So if it, what we all need, and this is why I leave it last, because it's really important, be aware of what is contaminated in your water around where you live, because you never know what that fight may look like. You never know how this will help inform your medical responses with healthcare and health insurance and just overall taking care of your bodies and yourselves. But also when you do need advocates and allies who can support you, you already know what's poisoning and polluting your area. So definitely visit that website to be aware of your area and what's happening and hurting you. Yeah. And, and also not just yourself, but your neighbors or that, or that community nearby, you know, that might be suffering exactly. unf- unfairly and you can be a, a voice of support for, uh, for change for them. Awesome. Yes. Well, um, I'm glad we caught up. It, I guess, uh, our, our quarantine yeah. status and, and makes that a little bit easier. Um, but thank you so much for the time and for, uh, all the work you're putting in on behalf of people out there. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Travis, for having me. This was this is wonderful. Thank you. All right. And stay safe. Yeah, you too. You too. <laughs> All right. Bye bye. Waterloo, Waterloo, Waterloo. Thank you to the sponsor of this episode, the Flume Smart Water Monitor, that tracks your home's water use twenty four seven, alerting you to excessive water use and leaks. Use promo code Waterloop now for fifteen percent off at flumetech.com. You're in the Waterloop. Waterloo.